Okay, I think uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Haas. So Mike has been with the university for 17 plus years and he has been instrumental in designing the cybersecurity standards for OSU's building management system. So over to you, Mike. We are looking to learn from you about your experience okay. designing the secure buildings. Great. So I have a bunch of slides here. Um, I'll be honest, we're going to talk a little bit about governance today, which is not my favorite topic in cybersecurity, but it's important. Um, we'll jump right into it. So a little bit about me. Um, I work for OTDI, which is formerly known as the OCIO. I'm a sub-department of there, which is Digital Security and Trust. Um, we have maybe 60 people there that do cybersecurity for the university. Um, Specifically, I manage our industrial control system cybersecurity program. I manage Ohio State's passive vulnerability security tools. I reside on Ohio State's red team. I specialize in um, OT device security testing, uh, facility risk assessments, and I think that's about it. Um, I'm also a Columbus uh, board member of CS2AI, which is a group that specializes in industrial cybersecurity. We have uh, quarterly meetings here in Columbus. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. So in this presentation, we're going to go over operations technology, uh, some cybersecurity design requirements, uh, security testing. And at the end, if we have time, I put some slides together of risk assessments that I've done on campus, and I'm going to ask you guys to identify what's wrong in the picture or what, what is there a, a potential risk there. So I'm not going to go over this slide, but these are the, some of the topics I intend to address in the presentation. We'll review this slide later in the uh, presentation to make sure we sort of covered all these, these various topics. Um, at Ohio State, what are industrial control systems? Uh, they basically monitor, regulate, and automate operations technology. All of these are examples of what we call PLCs, programmable logic controllers that we have on campus. They control systems anywhere from uh, chill water, high pressure steam, distribution, consumption, desuperheating. Um, we have um, HVAC, obviously. Uh, a lot of different critical systems for processed chill water that feeds labs, uh, fume hood exhaust systems, um, all that sort of uh, technology. This is an example of uh, a PLC um, out in the field. Uh, you can see that it has some pneumatic sensors. We call those EPs for electric pneumatics. Uh, we have inputs on the, uh, the left side, outputs on the right side. And uh, this is typical. I believe this is a chill water controller for, for Scout Lab specifically. Um, if you take a look at Scott Lab, I, I don't think many folks realize the amount of mechanical space within a, a, a building. So if you look at those top sections here on both sides of the building, and even back here in the, in the smaller part, all that is reserved for mechanical space. So that's where you see all the, the mechanical systems and steam pressure stuff. We have also below ground almost the equivalent amount of space for mechanical systems. Now, this is an example. I'm going to go through some examples before we talk about securing the system, just so you get an idea of what we're looking at. This is a uh, high pressure steam station over at Scott Lab. You can see the gauge there is reading 200 psi. So we have very high pressure steam on campus. Uh, we're slowly converting that over to hot water systems because it's a little bit uh, less dangerous and less wear and tear on the uh, systems and more efficient. Um, this is 600 degree heat, uh, super heat, we call it steam. This, I think I'll have to ask someone to turn off their mic. Uh, Jake, can you please turn off your mic? Yes, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no worries. Um, this is an example of a uh, do super do. <laughs> D superheater. These are giant valves that have the, the high pressure steam going through them. Uh, definitely, it's scary when we turn these system on because the water immediately flashes into steam and you hear lots of banging sounds. And we have electronic control systems that control this stuff. And it's uh, it's very. Uh, if you watch the people that are experienced with it, they're usually at the door when they're turning on these systems so they can leave if there's some sort of malfunction. 
Uh, this is an example of a, a mechanical room. This is very common of what most camp mechanical rooms look like on campus. Here's an example of fume hood exhaust. This is hazardous exhaust, and we have uh, this is called strobic exhaust. So what it does, it tries to throw after it goes through a, a HEPA filtration. It tries to throw the exhaust high up into the air so that any contaminants that are left behind can can get away from from campus. The reason why we see two there is it's a redundant system. So if one fails, the other one kicks on. Uh, Generators, uh, this picture on the right is an example of an air handler. Uh, one building can have a handful of these up to a dozen, depending on the size of the building. Like, so if you think of your furnace at home, uh, this is what the same thing, but you can actually walk into this one. You can see it has three doors. That's how you change the filters and service the motors and, and different mechanical elements on it. Um, one of our newer facilities, the uh, lacrosse stadium, has a uh, heated um, turf area. So we run hot water below the turf because that way they can play in the wintertime and the softness also reduces injuries on the athletes. Um, this picture on the left we took, it was, I think, maybe 15 degrees outside and the field temperature was roughly uh, 50 degrees. This is the, uh, the new pump house that um, is used to divert water from the Olentangy past campus in an emergency situation. Uh, we control this. I believe each pump uh, can move roughly 27,000 gallons of water, and there's three of them there, so that's, that's a lot of water. The, the best of my knowledge, we have not had to uh, activate these pumps yet. One of the newer buildings on campus, I'm sure you've all seen by now, is the uh, advancement and um, EAC, EAIC um, center. Basically, this has a solar array on top that produces up to one third of the building's power. Um, when the building um, is not using that power, we have the ability to back feed the grid, uh, which we, we don't really do anywhere else, but with this facility. There is a, um, because of the solar panels, there's DC electricity up there, which is a concern for the safety and firefighters that have to go up there. So we have an emergency stop in there for the firemen. We had to put special um, uh, water systems up there uh, for the firefighters to, to, to uh, put out fires. And we don't want them climbing on here while this thing is actually active. That's very dangerous. Uh, you'll notice these little black boxes underneath the solar panels. Those are all wireless. And those uh, that's how we communicate um, the rapid shutdown system to turn it off. Now it's reversed, so it has to have the signal to remain on. If it loses the signal, it, it goes off, shuts power off to those, those devices. So these uh, these can be can so these is just giving the information, but you're not you're sending any information to these black boxes. Well, that, that's right. We do get some information from it, but if if there's a communication failure, they'll turn off by automatically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things with this facility is we really didn't consider what happens when it snows and the potential runoff of snow. So we had to build an ad hoc gutter system after the fact to keep snow and ice from falling onto the public. Uh, this is the, what's called the building rectifier. So this is where the DC power from the grid from the solar array comes in and mixes with the grid. So when we're not producing solar energy, we can mix that with, with the grid. So the picture on the left, if you look there, you see the sort of a, a tan colored um, airtight, watertight box. And the picture on the right is what's inside that box. Um, <clears throat> if you notice there, at the very top there, there's a cradle point cell modem, uh, which the vendor installed. And when we do assessments, this is something we look for. We're seeing a lot of this now. It's very difficult for us to find these things and it basically bypasses all of our security because it's a backdoor to the system. We have requirements that the vendors must let us know where they put these in. Um, we try to prohibit them where possible. Now, in this case here, we have put all the responsibility on the vendor. We, are, we do not actually have any network connections to this system. It's solely connected to the vendor oversell. So we're gonna go a little bit over functional requirements. Um, Ohio State has something called uh, the ISCR. This is uh, really where all of our, our cybersecurity controls are, are founded and based off of. 
And they're broken down into these various areas here. Now, the top uh, several sections are all based on IT. And you see the last section there is, is based on um, operations technology for industrial control systems. Now, the IT selection, IT section has roughly 300 controls in that group. We were able to basically eliminate 100 of those controls for groups that just manage operations technology and then supplement that with an additional 50 controls that specifically addresses operations technology risk. And we've had this framework, it's been out since maybe for, for OT for since 2018, and I believe compliance was required roughly 2020, 2021. So we've been actively in compliance with this around the university for a while now. So we look at non-functional requirements. Um, Basically, we build performance and scalability into the system. Uh, we do not max out the control systems. We have um, limitations on how much IO that we can use, so we can expand that out if we need to add or modify the system later. The same goes for the two wires. So many, many of these devices have a, a Ethernet connection and a two wire bus that uses RS-45 for various protocols like back then MSTP. We um, limit the amount of devices on that bus um, and if we tend to increase the amount, we'll just put another sort of system level Ethernet device and manage it. And why we do that is it helps keep our speed up, latency down, uh, makes it easier to troubleshoot, and it's a lot less uh, overhead on the system level Ethernet device that's managing it. Usability. So if you make your security controls too complex and too cumbersome, you're going to add ad hoc risk to the systems. You're going to have system engineers that are going to figure out ways around your cybersecurity controls, like adding uh, wireless access points to bypass security measures and those sorts of things. Um, maintainability, so, you know, a lot of vendors can create some really complicated logic in the controllers. We sort of make them dump things down so that uh, a technician, we have a lot of turnover in our maintenance groups, so we want to keep the logic very simple so that, um, you know, instead of doing things in 10 lines of code, we might do it in 20, but it makes it easier for the end user to sort of go through that code. So we, we uh, that's one of the requirements we have. And I'll go through where those requirements reside. Um, now we do have compliance and regulatory requirements for certain things like BSL3 labs and, and other, other secure uh, systems that deal with uh, critical research. Uh, those requirements are, uh, they supersede our requirements. So we, we clearly have to follow that. We usually get measured on those. Um, Performance metrics are hard, um, you know, be, not being hacked is not a really great metric. So it's, it's difficult to get metrics out of the system. So it's something we're working on. We, we look at a lot of vulnerabilities and logs and how, you know, how many vulnerabilities are, do we have? How many are we patching each year? That's one of the metrics we sort of look at. And I'll go over that here a little bit later. Um, and then audit ability. Uh, so you have to be able to audit these groups to make sure they're following policy. We do that through logging, um, making sure that uh, you know we can we can look at logs, we can look at policies, we can look at make sure they have procedure doc documents. We have a separate team that call internal audit that will go through and make sure they're in compliance. We also have an annual survey that says, "Hey, how close are you to uh, meeting this security control?" And <clears throat> um, uh, one yeah. question. So in the previous slide, when you talked about maintainability of logic, mm -hmm. uh, what logic is that? Is that like on attack detection side? Is, it, is that on control side? So being the, the controls, the, the PLC itself. So PLC. it has a sequence of operations to run whatever it's running, whether it's a trail water system, steam system, or any other. Um, there's different, each manufacturer has different ways to code their logic. Some's ladder logic, some sort of basic, but um, we, there's ways to make it easier for the end user to follow, and you can definitely do things complicated too. So, yeah. So, comprehensive security design. Basically, we're, you want to address both functional and non-functional elements to ensure the necessary functions are in place, but you also don't want to make sure that it overly complicates the system. You know, you might have a person out there that really goes all in on security, but He's the only one that's really doing it, and if he leaves, you're really in big trouble because he might have a really complicated way of, of, of implementing that. And a lot of times, we don't have a lot of people that are, are in the orgs that do this sort of thing. So it might be one guy, two guys at best, or individuals. Um, so being able to document those things and be able to reverse engineer them and manage them is, is really important. Um, and then, of course, you want to be balanced. You don't want to solely uh, 
fun have functional crime evidence that might lead to robust security uh, features that are uh, difficult to use or maintain, um, while ignoring non-functional requirements could result in insecure systems. So there's a balance there of like how much security. And so one of the things like I, when I manage our passive vulnerability system, I sort of crank down the alerts every few months on there. So that they'll generate a bunch more alerts to the asset owners. And then once we get those ironed out, then everybody's happy and we'll crank it down again a little bit, right? So we don't want to throw a million alerts at them all the time because they're just going to ignore them. So it's one of the ways that I, I like to try and handle that. Um, we also have an exception process. So if we have all these security controls and somebody says, hey, you know, I, I just, I can't do this because either there's too much money involved and we're, we're willing to accept that risk or the system's not capable of, of um, of implementing this sort of security control, or we really would need that cell modem, right? So we prohibit cell modems, but maybe the vendor requires it and we have to have it there. So we have an exception process that requires the organization to um, have senior leadership sign off and it helps document where that risk is so we know where it is. They have to review it every year. And the really good thing about it is that it requires senior leadership to prove off. So if you're somebody that's a boots on the ground type person that knows about this risk and you're concerned about it, you lose sleep about it, you can report it to, to us or we'll find it when we do assessments. And his boss or her boss, high up leadership, is gonna to have to sign off and be accountable for that risk. Well, they often don't wanna be accountable for that risk, so they will fund the enhancements or technology needed to reduce that risk. So that's a lot of, a lot of how, the way how we get things funded at the university. And it, it's, it's a good approach, because I, I, I used to be the person that used to lose sleep at night with certain risks that we had. And it wasn't until I went over to, uh, to cybersecurity to where I could help those departments get the funding they needed to, to improve uh, their, their risk. Um, Mike, uh, yeah. quick question. Have we been attacked before? Well, I can't. Like, assess the risk, I guess, there is only if you are attacked or potentially attacked, then there is a risk. I mean, we're, we're at Target, we're, we're getting, we're a target, right? So okay. I say it's a big target. Okay. Um, now, if <clears throat> I can't say for certain that our operations technology stuff has, has been attacked. Um, when I first started, we had no firewall. We were publicly exposed. Like you could be at home and pull up a PLC and get to it. And you'll still find it now, not here at Ohio State, hopefully, but other places. Um, but we, to the best of my knowledge, there has not been any sort of recent um, attacks on critical infrastructure okay. operations. Okay. Um, I can't answer that for, for other areas of the university. Sure. Yeah. Um, so a basic project, let's kind of run through this and show you how this works. This, this is kind of the secret sauce of how we do stuff. So we have our building design standards. That's a public URL, you can get to that. Um, below um, the standards, you'll see something called the Appendix A. We have three different departments on campus that manage the buildings here. We have facilities, operations, and development, which do classrooms and labs, this building here. Uh, we have our student life group, which does our dorms and eateries. And then we have um, the medical center, obviously, for our, our medical center facilities. Each one has separate requirements that the, the designers must follow when they go to build a building here on campus. And we go down to the type of wire that needs to be used that we talk about. The, uh, the I.O. expansion capability, how much I.O. we still want, the types of vendors. So each vendor has, each department has to have at least three vendors to be able to, uh, to go out for, to bid on a project. Uh, that's just the way the state works. It's difficult for us to sole source one vendor. Each department has a separate group of three vendors, although there might be some commonalities between the three. Um, once it goes out to bid, um, well, actually, I want to touch a little bit on that vendor selection process. So, we have, um, the way we think of vendors is, are they capable of managing the project from a capacity, like how, like, you know, the med center, for example, the new hospital is a huge building. Some of our smaller vendors here in Columbus might have a hard time managing that project. How close are they to the university? So if we need their help for spare parts, that sort of thing, how fast can we get here? Um, and really our past experience with them, how well have they done builds in the past? How, how good are they here as a vendor? So we, we do know, a lot of these technicians and people over the years, we get, we get a, we, they know how to work with us. Each one gets their own uh, security background check. They get uh, guest accounts here at the university. And we have um, service level agreements that we require so that they know how to operate here on campus. 
uh, it's, you know, we have FOD alone is managing 180 buildings, so we can't be in those buildings all the time. So we rely a lot on those vendors to come in, have remote access to the systems. They have backups to our systems, and we make sure that they follow all of our requirements uh, to manage all that stuff. Um, we go through bits and middle reviews. We look at the vendor will drop the diagram of how things are going to be uh, set up for the control system. We review that and we'll have questions and we'll, we'll either approve or make them change it to, to meet our approval. In that approval process, we also look at our cybersecurity elements. Do, does it meet our design requirements for, for that? Um, and then we go through their process to select the vendor. If there's new hardware that's being presented in the uh, job that we haven't used before, we go through uh, security testing. So we will test that hardware. We'll try and we'll, we'll go over exactly what that is about later. I have some slides on that. But basically, we make sure that there's no hidden back doors in it that we that we can find, and we look to make sure it's compatible with our existing infrastructure and, and building management system. And we'll, we'll say, okay, this is fine. You can you can bid on this project with this hardware, or maybe you need to make these changes before you can bid. Um, after everything is done. And the building's handed over to Ohio State, or right before that happens, uh, we go through what's called commissioning. Uh, so on large projects, we'll have a third-party commissioning company that comes in, and they look at that submittal that was originally approved by Ohio State, and they make sure that everything matches those submittals. That includes valve position. So if we send 100% to open a valve, that, that valve actually opens, and everything's direct acting or reverse acting, et cetera. Um, and the last thing we do before we connect the building to the building management system or the IT network here, we go through a risk assessment. So we do a walkthrough, we look at the building, and that's what you guys are gonna do a little bit later, virtually here. Um, we look and say, okay, is this in compliance? Is there any hidden cell modems? Is there any sort of risk factors here we need to address before we connect it? Because basically we don't wanna bring risk into our existing infrastructure. We wanna make sure that everything's sort of patched, current rev levels, there's no, nothing left behind that, that we're concerned of. So we also have uh, asset and system requirements, and this is part of how we rate the security controls and what we determine is applied to them. So we uh, first need to say, is this asset really an industrial control system asset? So maybe if it's a lighting control system, we don't put that on the same exact network as the building control system because it's not as critical, right? So we can sometimes logically segment that, put it on a separate network VLAN away from the critical components in the building. A lot of times there's requirements for the lighting control system or other systems to talk out to the cloud where we're trying to uh, segment the internet from, from our building control systems. And we'll go over that here in another slide as well. Um, institutional data policy, if you're not familiar with this, most of you probably are, we look at uh, what's, um, what kind of data is flowing around in the system. Now with, with uh, control systems, it's usually S2, which is internal, S1 being public and S4 is being our most critical data, which is, could be vulnerability data, social security numbers, that sort of stuff. You're not gonna see social security numbers on building control systems. So this usually isn't a huge factor with us, but we do rate systems in criticality. So what is the impact of that system if it fails? So, you know, maybe here at Dries Lab, um, I'm not sure I, what exactly our lab's here, but you know, for us, it's not so bad because maybe we could have class at home remotely instead of coming in today. Uh, if it's a uh, Scott lab or some animal lab, then it's, much more critical issues so we rate those systems higher um, and also we look at what else can it see right so if Dries lab can see uh, baker system and baker systems has a server room in it then we're going to rate Dries lab higher because of its lateral exposure to that um, and again that's all part of how we rate our information security control requirements so i don't want to spend too much time on this because it's, it's a little heavy in governance but each it control has uh, what we call a bubble, and we might mark down if it applies to OT or ICS through that. So, so that's how we determine <laughs> if the control applies to the system. And we also have bubbles for S1 through S4 and C1 through C4. So not all security controls apply to everything. So if the control is really, if it's a really critical asset, then we have controls that are just C4 uh, applied controls, and it might be for IT and OT. But that's, that's kind of the boring stuff. I don't want to spend too, too much time on how we do that. Um, future requirements that we're looking at is secure by design. This is something that CISA is doing. We're not really seeing that yet on, on our side of the house, but they are trying to make hardware less exploitable, um, making it so that there's not 
services that are risky, that are unnecessary, even the processors on there, we, you don't need certain processing elements for something as simple like the building automation controller. SBOM, software bill of materials, lets us know where the products are coming from. We do have some restrictions. We try not to purchase things from, from known uh, adversaries or risky areas, but that's really hard to do. Um, and of course, hardware bill of materials too, that tells us where, where things are being produced. But there's a lot of work to, you could spend a whole, a whole meeting uh, lecture just on those two things there. But you should know about them because they, they are important. This is what our this is how we rate criticality. This is our we call our criticality matrix. So we'll take an asset or control system and run it through here. So the free time we're using uh, the Drew Slab uh, system. If it's down, this is probably the yellow box is probably where we're going to fall. Now the second column here, this is OSU insurance information. This is basically the uh, the dollar amount of impact that we could potentially have. And wherever, so, so this one is the worst scenario. So we want this building up within 48 hours. So therefore, um, this building or control system would be a C3. So the highest one in, in this group here is how we're going to rate that asset. So now we know we're going to apply C3 controls to all of the, um, the assets in the control system for this building. And this clearly changes based on the building. If you have, like, we're looking at CBEC or another building that has some critical labs, this is going to go way up if you're dealing with fume hood exhaust and animals and that sort of thing. So this is a really important slide. This is really the fundamental way that we secure operations technology. This is uh, something that ISA 62443 developed. It's, uh, it's called the Purdue Model of Segmentation. It was originally designed for um, a way of organizing things on a manufacturing plant floor, but it's now applied to cybersecurity. Um, the really important thing to know here is the difference between IT and OT, and we made a really large effort to get the OT systems out of our IT networks and create what we call segmentation here. And everything that goes between the OT and IT must either originate or terminate through a DMZ. So we do not allow communication to go directly from the IT number to the OT or vice versa. Um, we can have multiple DMZs and we can have multiple manufacturing zones. Uh, oftentimes one building will be one manufacturing zone. So we can have 180 manufacturing zones just for, for FOD alone. Up here in the DMZ, you're gonna see things like jump host servers. So, instead of having direct access to remote into a control system, you're gonna get into a jump host machine. You're gonna remote into that jump host machine. And from the jump host machine, you're gonna be able to log in to, to the system down here and be able to make changes. So it's a, it's a secure way of, of providing remote access. And then you're gonna have multi-factor authentication to get into that jump host before you can even get down here. Now, we just assume everything here is vulnerable, right? This is unencrypted protocols, um, <clears throat> The devices are potentially 20 years old. Um, they're very sensitive to being scanned. Mo many of them have vulnerabilities that can't be patched. There's, if they have a password, it might be six characters long. Um, so we built what's called this layer of defense architecture. So we build these layer of defenses and we put monitoring and logging, firewalls, so that we can sort of give us time to react to threats um, as we get detections coming in. Um, but if you build all the segmentation, you know, we can see what goes north south, right? So we have good, good longs in that. We can see the firewalls tell us what traffic is passing through it. We can really restrict that. Uh, and we do, right? We do egress filtering so that we limit things by, by IP address on the outbound side, by DNS name, that sort of thing. But you have to have visibility down here to know what's going on. And, you gotta have lateral visibility so you can see east-west in that network. So we do that through um, other tools, which we'll address it in a future slide, um, through passive network monitoring, where we will span all this traffic from a network switch to a single port. Spanning is just sort of like mirroring, so we take all the traffic that's on the network and mirror it to a single single device on there that can sort of monitor everything that's going on. So they, they get this what we call east-west visibility or, or lateral visibility. And if you have, like, Feel free to stop me at any point in here if you have questions. I'm 
I have a question. So uh, recently, Arkansas's water system was attacked. I don't know if you're aware of that. What was the question? The the the, the sewage system or the water treatment system yes. in Arkansas. Yes, yes, I have a slide on that. Yeah, so that's okay. that's good, and it's good that we talk about actually when I have this up. So, um, you know, one of the things we, when you talk about risk is really going after the low hanging fruit, right? So you don't have to. You can do a lot by just getting the internet away from these systems. And the water systems that were recently attacked by Iran were up at the enterprise zone, at the level five. They were internet facing devices that were compromised using default passwords. Right? So, two bad things internet facing and default passwords. No, so I don't even want to call that a nation state of hack because any of you in here could have really done the same thing. The only thing that they did was sort of interesting was change the, the logo on the screen, which, which I. I have a picture that I'll show you later. Um, now there are tools that there's there's a, a malware called uh, Ink Controller and Pipe Train that um, have tools that are designed to impact machines on that DMZ historians, jump host machines, engineering workstations down here that will allow them to interact with the control system. That's uh, the only malware that, that I'm aware of that, that has those tools built into it. But we are seeing newer threats that's targeting the control systems. And we hear about ransomware. You can't really run, it's difficult to run ransomware on those PLCs I was showing you before because they don't run typical Windows processes. So, you know, you're going to see that ransomware up at the IT level or maybe at this engineering workstation. You're not going to see it down here. I think the only instance I'm aware of that is. Um, the North Hydra one where they were actually able to hit the PLCs. Now, if we, like the coal pipe um, one where we had to shut down the, the gas production or, or pipeline, um, that was on the IT level. The OT was never impacted. So they, they just shut, they shut down the OT as a precaution, but it was actually the IT side of the house that was impacted by, uh, by the ransomware. But there's a lot of money. So if you're looking at production, like, so you have manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, campus here, uh, you know, the, the pipeline was very expensive. So there's a lot of motivation for threat actors to, to hit these systems because you're, you're likely to pay ransomware. And a lot of the stuff doesn't get, a lot of the attacks do not get publicized either. We don't hear about everything. Uh, so this is, uh, we talked about passive monitoring. So how do, we, how do we have that visibility down there at the, um, at the lower level, um, that manufacturing zone? So we use a product called Tempo OT. And this is what it looks like. So we do what's called scanning. So we take, uh, there's a couple different ways to do it, but scanning is the most common way to do it. We take all the traffic that's on that network switch and bring it over to uh, a single port. And it basically mirrors all that traffic. So we can see everything that's going on and we, we can passively, so when I say passively, there are systems out there in the IT world that do active scanning. They'll actively interrogate the device. They'll scan it and like Nessus is a common one where you're looking at all 65,000 ports and, and scanning for services running uh, on that device. We don't want to scan um, PLCs because they're really sensitive. I, I think in the previous demo I, I did here, I showed like, how easy it is to take down a PLC from an active interrogation. So passively, we can get, just by watching the traffic and not interacting with the device at all, we can get firmware, we can get MAC addresses, application versions, uh, we can get intrusion detection signatures, you know, we get anomaly detection, all kinds of cool stuff that we can we can see um, remotely, and, it, and it's pretty accurate. We can get almost pretty much all of our assets that we have out there. It gives us asset visibility, so we can know what assets are out there. It's really important to you, big university. You got to know what's out there to, to protect it, and we also get the vulnerability information mapped to that firmware, so we know what devices need patched. Uh, spend a little bit of time on agents here. So agents, we think about as CrowdStrike, or um, uh, they, they even make agents for some of this passive stuff, right? So now they're doing some, some active approach where they'll run an agent, instead of scanning all 65,500 ports, they're gonna do uh, maybe one or two ports that it detects that's running on that control system. They're, they're apparently tested before <laughs> they actually do the interrogation. So maybe you're just testing Modbus or Backnet or something like that. Uh, we don't do that here, but that's sort of the way the industry is moving towards is running agents at maybe the historian or engineering workstation level. Um, now, CrowdStrike, um, that's also an agent, and we PLCs are not capable of running agents, but certainly those workstations are, those engineering workstations. Um, the interesting thing about agents too, like CrowdStrike, 
it is able to talk home to CrowdStrike. So if you're applying for, if you have their service to where they're managing uh, threat detection, uh, you're able to go through all those layers of defenses because it's tall enough to CrowdStrike. So if CrowdStrike gets compromised, CrowdStrike can, can talk back to, to, to that PLC or that engineering organization and bypass all your MFA, all of your, your secure services that you have out there. So it's something to consider. You can run CrowdStrike in uh, detection only mode and not, um, not active mode, but the recent um, outage that CrowdStrike had would not have prevented uh, the system from going down because it was a kernel issue. This right now was active or, or uh, monitor only mode. And then. So she has a question on what is, how do you detect fault versus attack? Yeah. So that's, that's a good question and it's something that's difficult to, to manage. So what the way we currently do that is we have alerts that go to the asset owners and they also go to me. And uh, we're trusting that the asset owners are gonna view those anomalies and alerts that go through. I see them as well. If I see something that doesn't look normal, then I will reach out to the asset owners and say, hey, did you get this? To kind of confirm with them that, uh, that it wasn't in fact a false alarm or they were, it just had somebody new working in the building that we weren't aware of because we'll see when a vendor connects a laptop or something like that to the system. Um, but it is a process of sort of creating what we call golden standard or benchmarking the system against a, a, a standard of, of, of how we have our parameters set and anything that's out, out of normal, we'll, um, we'll kind of do that. We also have security automation that our IT side wor works with and, and they do a really good job with the security automation piece. Uh, that's more of the upper border level stuff from the enterprise zone is where that, that mainly falls into place. But we do look at protocols across the north south. So we, we, can, we can see when a building automation protocol is going north out of the network and that shouldn't happen. So we block that through security automation. So we, we do some of that as well. So here's your picture of the water system uh, that was attacked. Uh, there was several uh, orgs that had this specific hardware that was compromised. Um, and basically what I wanna address this slide here is actual attack risk um, versus um, theoretical. So a lot of times we talk about these really complicated scenarios that you know are sort of like from the movies versus what is really happening out there. You know, what, what, what are bad guys actively going after? And, and let's focus our energy and resources and money at those things. So we look at like edge devices, VPNs, um, identity management. You know, we don't want to be sharing accounts, sharing multi-factor creds. Um, you know, how, how secure is your remote access? You know, do we have five ways to get in or just one? Um, how, how are you patching that? How are you monitoring vulnerabilities on, on that remote access system? Because again, this is that upper layer, layer stuff. We don't really we're not so concerned. We, get, we have more time to patch down those lower levels of the model. But up on the edge, we got to patch quickly. We got to be concerned about phishing, obviously ransomware, supply chain attacks. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that later. And uh, we, we did talk about the uh, intrusion de detection signatures for malware that is specific to um, the ICS. We can get that passively. We can see when malware like Pipedream or Incontroller comes in to the, to the network. Oh, and the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So th this is something that um, basically looks at all the common ways that adversaries get into um, compromised OT. So they have one for IT, and MITRE ATT&CK has also one for ICS. And so you can basically map your security controls that you're applying to your building and say, okay, does this cover all the risk points in the MITRE ATT&CK framework? And if you're not familiar with MITRE ATT&CK framework, it's, it's a really great resource, and it's a great way to uh, sort of define uh, realistic uh, attack scenarios on, on systems. Uh, some new technology that we're trying to use in projects is unidirectional gateway. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the cool thing about it is it has an optical transmitter and you no know, receiver, so we can send data one way. So if you have a firewall that allows data out, that's always a bi directional communication. You can always talk back and forth. Once you reach out, you can talk back in. This enforces that connection. It's one way only. There's no way to talk back because there's no fiber receiver on the other side. We can push data right out into the cloud or wherever we want to go without having to worry about any sort of uh, compromise back. 
Uh, deception technology is something we're looking at too. I'm hoping to get it here in the new project. Basically, we can spin up all these different controllers and lures and decoys, uh, IoT devices, and they're fake. They're virtual machines that look like a Modbus controller or a, a backpack device or something with talent services, so all the stuff that you would commonly find in a control system. Maybe Windows 7 machine. We can put that on the DMZs where we kind of really want to monitor that risk. And so when somebody interacts with that device, we're going to get an alert and we're going to know that somebody is on the network that shouldn't be. Right? These are really juicy targets that adversaries would, would want to go for first because they're really easy to sort of uh, spot, detect, and interact with. So decoys are just a server running some input output. Like they have some input output behavior as well, or like let's say a heart pump or infusion pump or something like a medical device. So does it send some reading like this is the, I don't know, some whatever medical reading back to the cloud, but those are like all false reading. And yeah. So. IOMT, the medical device stuff, is a separate sort of area of, of risk, and a lot of OT concepts can be applied to it, but there is that really need for cloud interaction with IOMT. Mm -hmm. um, we, I was head on the IOMT working group here for, for evaluating some of that risk. Um, it is a complicated area to, to manage because you do have like MRI machines that are running old versions of Windows and, and like that. So we do make an effort to segment those systems. Mm -hmm. um, these decoys and lures are specifically for um, operation technology, but certainly if you're running like other protocols like FTP and Telnet, it would it would work in those scenarios or any sort of virtual machine. But we we're not doing that to the best of my knowledge yet um, over there. Yeah. Uh, could you use a unidirectional gateway for that? Potentially, but it doesn't work well because you have so many different vendors in that space. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have just a couple of vendors here that we need to send data to for from our building control systems, or we can aggregate that data before we send it out to, to somebody. Um, with IOMT, you're going to all sorts of different vendors. Oh, um, <clears throat> so I'll go through this quickly. I'm going to leave enough time and, to go over our uh, risk assessment here, but we do security testing. This is one of the fun things I like to do here in campus. Um, so we do compatibility testing to make sure the new product that they're using works with our current building management system. We do uh, vulnerability scans, and we will actively hit these devices and see what we can we can find, enumerate, and break. Um, we look to see what services are running, what versions of those services are on there. Do they really need to be running? Are there known exploits for those services? And then we'll develop. Um, hardening guidelines for the department and saying, hey, here's what we found. Here's the risk. If you're going to deploy it, this is how you should deploy it securely. Um, some of the uh, this, here's some other stuff we've, we've tested. This is a wireless lighting control system. Both these, I think, are lighting control systems. We were able to um, we were able to do replay attacks on the wireless signals here. So that's what this looks like. Uh, we're able to uh, send uh, nurse calls, operate lights and window shades uh, remotely with, with just capturing the wireless signals from the system and replaying them. Um, and we let the vendor know, we let the, you know, we let the, the, the uh, department know and say, hey, maybe the probability of this attack is low, but it's there, you know? Could somebody have a nurse call and 100 beds in the hospital at once? Yeah, potentially. But you, know, you gotta be within a certain range and, uh, and, and how likely is that risk? This is, when we do service enumeration, this is sort of some of the information we get back, what it looks like. Uh, this is an example of a hidden config page that we found for one of our systems where we could go in without any sort of um, authentication and, and modify the, the uh, configuration of the device. Uh, this one is interesting because they gave us a, a hardening uh, guideline, which is really good. Not all the vendors do that. Um, but everything you see down here is information, DNS information that was not in their, their guideline. This is, these are websites that it was talking out to that were not, not defined. One of them happened to be, um, this check IP, DNS, it happened to be the, one of the engineer's um, home lab that uh, he was using for, for testing was built into the firmware of the device. So 
if we said, okay, this system's good, we're just gonna go ahead and let this, let this talk out to these devices, and then we'll lock it down after the fact, it could have been calling out to this guy's house or to these other, other um, domains. And one, one of the things that a lot of adversaries do, they'll take a look at this, this, model, like this example domain here. Once it's expired, they'll register that domain. And so now it goes, they can set the IP back to where, where that, that domain is registered to. So you can have the best firewall in the room. If you allow this domain name to talk out, you're going to allow that, that connection out to that adversary, which is going to have unrestricted access back in because you made that call out to, to, that, to that individual. Uh, we also look for other things we were able to find the, the MySQL password in there um, and the username in plain text. And, you know, maybe that's okay because it's buried down in that secure layer um, of, of, of that Purdue model. But we want to call attention to it and say, hey, is this stuff supposed to be there? So we, we work with the, the vendor and, and, the, uh, and the department to, to let them know. Um, here's all examples of port 80 traffic, which is, again, plain text. We're able to, to detect. And this is sort of an example of what a report looks like. Uh, we identify potential cyber risk and impact scenarios, work with the vendors to address these concerns and improve their products. Um, we try and disable or block unused services and communication ports that aren't needed to harden these devices. And we make recommendations for deployment and segmentation. Um, a lot of times, uh, segmentation is really the key of getting the, the systems that need to reach out to the cloud away from, from our other secure systems segmented. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but if you had to do five things to secure your OT network, this is these are the top five security controls. Um, a good way to understand your incident response plan is to do a tabletop exercise. Uh, say your you could say your systems were hit with ransomware and you had to disconnect from the internet, like the University of Michigan, right? They had to disconnect from the internet first day of school for, for three days. How would that impact operations in your department or Ohio State, right? So we can run through that. Creating a defensible architecture that gives you time to respond to attacks and detect attacks um, through um, visibility and network monitoring, secure remote access, and a risk-based vulnerability management program that addresses real risk, looking at those edge appliances, going after those first. So hopefully these are um, these topics were all answered um, in the uh, presentation. If not, um, do you have any specific questions on these topics? Anything that you want to answer in here? If not, I'm going to run right to the, uh, the assessment. Okay. All right, so we're going to do a visual walkthrough of a bunch of pictures that I've uh, taken through various assessments. They're not all from the same building, and we'll see if you can find uh, what's wrong in the picture. So uh, this first one on the left, some of these are a bit hard probably, but the one on the left I think is pretty easy. So what, on this picture on the left here, what, what do you guys think is, is bad with this device? All right. There's a key switch here, and it's in the remote position, REM, which means that it can accept commands from a remote connection. If it was in the run position, you would not be able to write to it, even if you had access to it. So this is something that we would call out an assessment that should be always in the run position unless you're uh, either, it's either in program mode locally or if it's in remotely, that, that's a risk, right? This picture over here, this is more of a hard one. Here we have an unmanaged switch in the corner that's providing access to that. Unmanaged switches are sort of invisible to the network. They have no MAC address. They also provide the ability for somebody to plug into. So if somebody had access to this, you could plug into that network and, and sort of uh, gain access to it. So that's, that's a no-no. Um, this picture on the left here, this is a chill butter pump. Uh, I'll give you a clue. If you look at the picture above it, let me give you a clue of what, what the risk is here. So it's missing this protective housing around the shaft here. So that, that shaft has been around. If you have a lanyard on or something like that and bend over, you can, it, it's, it's a very risky uh, situation there. And that, that pump is actually running. So that's something we'll call out in assessment. Uh, this picture here. This is a handoff auto switch. So 
Right now, this piece of equipment is running in hand. If it was running in auto, that means that the control system is sending the signal to turn it on or off. This piece of equipment is overridden because it's switched in hand. We don't know why it's overridden, but you know, it could be because uh, they're working on something or the, they had to modify something in the building. But this is something we would call out in an assessment to the, uh, to the building control system team. Um, we have a VFD over here on the left, variable frequency drive. You can see it's 480 volts, and the key to open it is assigned to it. Over here, we have a uh, PLC that's used for uh, routing running control system information. You notice the transformer is taped up there to the top. Often, you'll see people in the rooms take outlets for um, various pieces of equipment, charge a laptop, whatever. This should be hardwired. We should not be using uh, outlets to power control systems. Over here on the left, this is a uh, control uh, center box for power, motor control. Um, you notice that it's off, but there's no lockout tag out in there, so there should be a lock in that uh, in that little spot there to, to keep people from, from turning that on. If somebody's working on a piece of equipment and somebody flips that on, that could be a life safety issue. How about this one? I think this one's a little easier maybe. Give you a clue, it's in the top right. The light, the light. AT&T, it's hard to see, but that's a sum of them stuck into a, another control panel, right? And they're hard to see, this seems driving me crazy because they provide, they provide direct access to that bottom layer of that Purdue model. They bypass all of our detections, all of our, our multi-factor authentication, remote access, and provides access right into the, the, the core of the control system. So do these routers also have their own firewall and things like that, or they are really unsecure? They should, but we don't have, we don't manage them. We don't have access to them, right? Oh. So so we we don't have a way. We could put a, a, a intermediate device between there that, that we manage, but yeah, we have no way of controlling or enforcing who has access to that. Are they sharing a password with 100 different employees? Is it is the password the same for every AT and T router that they manage? You know, right. probably is. Right. So. Um, <clears throat> this is that. Um, this is a picture from the HMI from the um, the cross stadium uh, field gain system. Uh, this one's a little bit more complicated. Um, I'll give you a clue. It is in the the bottom left. The Outside air temperature is failed at zero degrees. So a lot of decisions made in the control system are based on the outside air temperature. Uh, so, so you can see that that point is failed at it's reading zero. I think, so zero is the default value there? Well, I, I knew it wasn't zero degrees outside. So it, 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 can, be a, it can be zero or it can be a fault, but it, it, was, it was cold, but it wasn't zero outside. Right. Right? So we would, in this, in this case, it's likely a default or mismapped uh, value, yeah. Or they haven't hooked up the, it was still maybe in construction, they haven't hooked up the outside air sensor yet, but something we would highlight in the risk assessment is that, hey, this system's running right now, and it's, uh, you know, there's no outside air reference. Uh, this was a little bit harder. Um, here, we have, these are hand off auto switches again. If you notice, this one up here is in hand. Um, so that means that signal's been overridden, and there's actually a potentiometer here where you can you can adjust the, the analog um, value of that signal there. Uh, the other one is um, something you always want to look up because we have water pipes over this panel. Uh, that's something that you, if, if it's a critical piece of equipment, that's something you don't want to have. The center one here, it is locked out with a piece of rope or old Ethernet cable. Uh, here, obviously, we have some poor connections, loose wires on this one. Here we have um, outside air dampers that are completely blocked with debris. And we already talked about this one. This is another example of a cell modem up at the top there, hidden in, into a uh, control cabinet. I think this is the last picture. Um, this is a uh, Condensate drain for a VRF system. So there's a pump there that pumps up the condensate from there. You can see 
the well is controlled below it. So if that condensate, condensate drain overflows, which it ultimately will at some point, it is going to destroy all the control right below it. Uh, that's my contact information. If you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> any question? Yeah. yeah. So the school has a lot of facility and equipment. How can you like update the security software? Is that every year, per year, or is that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, again, we try to use a risk-based approach to that, right? So if the software we have, we might have software that is 20 years old for this weird piece of equipment that uh, still has to be run on a Windows XP machine because it won't run on anything but that, right? So, but we bury that down as far as we can into that Purdue model of segmentation so that if we do have to run that XP machine, we'll isolate it, island it off as much as we can. Now, if we have a piece of software that's running higher up, like near the internet level, that's an edge appliance, and we're gonna try and make sure that that, that software is, is uh, still in service, that we have support contracts with that hardware and that vendor, and that it gets patched as, as soon as we can. Um, we have requirements that, that the vendor must tell us through a service level agreements when, when things should be patched, and when, the, when vulnerabilities come out. We also monitor for those vulnerabilities. We, we, I, I myself do some th uh, cyber threat intelligence, where I monitor all the, uh, the CVEs for, for OT stuff that we have on campus. And we have the, uh, our passive vulnerability monitoring system that will also map those known CVEs to known firmware and known software. So we have, we have a few tools that we can do that with. Okay. All right, yep, thank you.